Hello, my name is Casey Doremus, and I am by no means a podcasting expert. The reason I am doing this interview with Denver Beerman of Denver and the Mile High Orchestra is because I have been so inspired by this band for a long time, and I've had a hard time finding information about them. So I hope you can enjoy and learn a little bit more about this wonderful Christian artist, and please check out their music. Ladies and gentlemen, Denver Beerman of Denver and the Mile High Orchestra. When did you uh, when did you first get started with music? Well, I grew up in a musical family, like the family reunions and all kinds of things. Our family always gets together and plays music, you know, two, three, four hours at a time. You know, they're always strumming guitars and singing songs, and we have all kinds of different musicians in our family, guitarists and drummers, and my son plays banjo now even, oh, uh, you know, all kinds of different instruments. And so I started taking piano lessons when I was about five. My mom used to give some private, you know, piano lessons and different things, uh, you know, from the living room of, of our home to make some extra money growing up as well. Um, so it was always kind of surrounded by music. Did the piano thing for a few years and then started playing the trumpet in sixth grade band, um, you know, just like uh, everybody else going into right. junior high or middle school. I fell in love with it, just absolutely loved the horn. I'm really interested. I have a friend of mine that I went to high school with. He now is like a Yamaha young artist. He's doing really well for himself as a musician. Since he came through that school, there's a lot of kids who they really look up to him. They think they're going to be as successful as him. But I was lucky enough to see that like he worked really, really hard in high school. So I was kind of I'm always interested to hear like for you, what what was it like in high school for you? Uh, I grew up in a very small town, and I had a wonderful band director who really instilled an incredible amount of musicality in me. But I think because I grew up in such a small place, and I was, you know, one of the best musicians there, and I'm kind of a dreamer. I had big dreams, but I wasn't as focused on music as I should have been for wanting to make it my career. I thought I had some talent, and I think I did have some talent. I just thought, you know, I'm going to major in music, go to college, and maybe be able to do something significant. But I didn't practice near enough in high school. I, I I did a lot of activities, you know, with the jazz band, with the marching band, doing the, the typical high school band events. But I, I, gosh, I did not practice enough. And so young players out there that are very much aspiring to do something successful, depending on how serious you are about it, taking that time as a teenager in high school when you have some time to be able to practice and be able to garner experience doing different types of concerts and events. Any kind of event like that is Im- imperative. It's, it's important. Because what happened for me was I moved to Nashville, Tennessee to go to college at a pretty heavy commercial music school called Belmont University and was lucky enough to be able to get into the jazz band as a freshman. I played last I played fourth trumpet. I played last year, and Dr. James Kirk, not Dr. Jeff Kirk, sorry, uh, that sounds terrible. I've been <laughs> watching Star Trek so lately. But Dr., <laughs> he wasn't a doctor when I was there, but he is now a doctor. Dr. Jeff Kirk, our, our jazz band instructor, counted us off on the very first day and did the very first song. When he did that, you know, I took a big old breath to play my horn, and the craziest thing happened. The band started, and I didn't play a note. Like, I was literally frozen. Once I heard the kind of sound, once I heard the style that was coming out of all of these different players, I, I was paralyzed. I didn't, I acted like I was playing, but I wasn't playing. I was listening. And within two and a half seconds, there were a couple of thoughts that went through my brain very, very quickly. First off, the first thought was, wow, these guys are so good listen to them, listen to that sound, listen to the way they have command of their instruments. The second thought I had was, wow, I should have been practicing all those years that I had time to practice. 
And then the third thought I had was, wow, as soon as this rehearsal's over, I'm going to the practice room. Um, and so for me, getting really serious about it, putting the hours and the time in on the horn and really trying to dive dive into music beyond having fun happened for me in college. So, you know, I think I think in high school, if you're in the band program or if you're in choir, that can be some of the most fun you ever have in your entire life. Like, to this day, I've traveled the world, I've sung to millions of people, probably the most fun I ever had. Making music was in my high school jazz band. It was the most fun I've ever had. But at the same time, you know, if it's something that you really do long to be serious about, it's also an opportunity to not just have fun, to be able to to really get very uh, very much more developed at your craft. It just came a little later than that for me. Yeah, you said you went to Belmont University. What what was the was the main draw? Just the commercial music? Um, did you know what you wanted to do with music? I mean, I mentioned earlier I was a dreamer, so I had dreams of you know I didn't know what. In, in, exactly, but I knew that maybe I wanted to be some kind of a musical artist or I wanted to be involved full-time in music. For a while, I thought maybe I'll be a country artist. I, that was never going to happen. Uh, but I, I tried <laughs> lots of little tiny things when I was in school, recording different kinds of demos, writing different kinds of songs, auditioning for this kind of showcase, auditioning for this other kind of thing. I started in college as a music education major. Both my parents are teachers, and I have the utmost respect for any and every single teacher on the planet. He's talking about one of the hardest jobs on the planet. Um, and so I started off as an education major. Dr. Kirk, my jazz band instructor, was also my advisor to kind of help guide me through school and make sure that I was taking the proper courses and the proper schedule, all that kind of stuff. And after my first year, kind of looked at me and he said, Denver, you know, I see that you're an education major. Is this something that, are you, are you tremendously passionate about teaching? And at the time, as an 18, 19-year-old, I said, well, you know, I don't know that I really am. I said, you know, I have these dreams of maybe being able to, to be a full-time musician, but I've always thought I'm going to get this music degree as a teacher, as an edu- educator, so I could kind of, um, if, if it doesn't work out for me, if I don't have the opportunity to, to make a living in music, professionally that I could fall back and, and be an educator. And he really, he didn't tell me what to do, but he very much challenged me. He said, Denver, if you really are very serious about being a professional musician, he said, I think you have the ability to be able to do it, but it's going to take everything you've got. It's going to take all the focus, all the vision. It's going to take all the hard work and the creativity and the practice. And you need specific courses that are going to develop you for that kind of career, that an education Surely taking a musical education course is not going to do. So he said, if you're passionate about teaching, then be a music teacher. He said, if you're passionate about being an entertainer, then do that instead. But don't do one just to try to fall back on it. He's like, we need teachers that really want to be teachers. It was really, really, that was a poignant moment for me because I was like, gosh, you know, I guess I'd always kind of looked at teaching as a safety net, which it should never be. It should be something that we do because... We're passionate. We love. And as I've gotten older, I'm 41 now. My love to be able to kind of give back and to teach and to be able to kind of pour out what I feel like God has poured into me has grown. Uh, I don't know if there'll ever be a day where I'm a full time instructor or teacher, but that part of me has grown, which has been very, very powerful experience for me. But I do think that uh, I chose to go into uh, a commercial music degree program, and it was a life-changing experience for me. So much of what I learned getting that degree, I used all the time. You know, from there was a lot of orchestration and competition, uh, composition and arranging classes. As a commercial music major, we were required to take that we weren't required to take under a, a traditional music education program. And that has been the saving grace of, of my career, was being able to write my own music, the thousands, one thousands, one thousands dollars that I have saved writing my own orchestrations and arrangements alone as opposed to hiring a composer or an arranger to I, I would not be able to do what I do with a big band had I not had the ability to write all my own music and, and do it from scratch and I would not have had that had I not chosen to to go with a commercial music degree it's not for everybody but it was the right call for me yeah it's interesting because getting started with writing music I'm sure that really I mean that definitely helped and 
1998 that you started doing the Friday night concerts, and I think you said it was every other week at uh, Two Rivers Baptist Church. And is that that's how you guys kind of got your start? It sounded like. Yeah, yeah, we did. We didn't say, "Hey, let's form a band. And here's our name, and here's the angle we're going to do to market ourselves." It was just me asking my friends that played in the big band with me at college to come out to the, to the local church where I attended church and where I was involved in, in different forms of ministry, and they had outreach programs on Saturday evenings every other week to try to get more college students involved in the ministry of the church in Two Rivers. They asked me to host this show and to come in and bring, you know, up-and-coming Christian artists that were writing songs, recording albums, starting to travel, to try to feature them and give them more opportunities to expose their music. But they wanted me to be able to sing and perform two to three of my own songs every single week, and that was about the same time that I started taking some contemporary arranging classes where I was learning how to write, uh, how to write and arrange music for a big band. That was experimental. I mean, I was just literally, I was handwriting all the charts. I mean, you talk about writer's cramp. <laughs> writing, handwriting the scores, <laughs> handwriting the actual charts themselves. And then putting the music in front of my friends who you know, just said, I can't pay anything, but they're probably going to be Cute, right. There'll probably be some cute girls there and a bunch of food, and <laughs> and, and they would come yeah. out, and we would play these songs. And there were not a lot of people. Some of these things had as few as maybe 20 or 30 people at them. Some had as many as maybe 80 right. or 100. But that was our litmus test, and much, much, much to my complete shock, people really enjoyed the, the, the big band sound that I was creating to Christian uh, lyrics and the Christian songs. And it was all original. Uh, music that I was writing. Uh, we weren't really doing any covers or anything like that. And that's how it kind of just started. And then in 1999 is when we officially came up with the name. So I always kind of say that, you know, that we're in our 19th year. 2019 is going to be our, our 20th anniversary of Denver and the Mile High Orchestra. Well, yeah, and that's that's something I, I, I struggle with a lot because I run a big band. And I actually had a conversation with a couple guys the other day that said... Um, they, they said so, something along the lines of, if I was kind of guaranteed this was going to go somewhere more, I would practice more. Sure. And I kinda, it, makes, it makes me wonder, with, with your group, did you kind of encounter any, any issues like that with people where you had to kind of like tell people like, or let people go from the band? Or was it, for the most part, was everybody just happy, they just wanted to play? Well, I mean, in any band, in any kind of band, most of the time, nothing's ever going to be handed to you. Uh, nothing. And uh, if you uh, are the leader of the band, or if you own the band, or however, you know, there, anyone listening probably may have their own band or a member of a band, no one will ever care about your group the way you do. Right. They, they won't, even even the, the people in, in the group, because they may not have as much emotionally or time-wise, or they just may not have as much of an investment in it. And so you you have to learn how to inspire people. You have to learn how to be able to try to have a bigger picture and a bigger vision of where you're heading. Try to gain some traction of where you're going in the present day. Uh, remind yourself of where you've been. But, I mean, we had all kinds of things. I had guys that had, and you know, we got offered our first record deal in 99. We did a showcase at school that, that, that for the college that put us at the Ryman Auditorium in front of 1,200 people and we got a standing ovation. We were still in school, and I had two or three record companies calling my college dorm room answering machine the next morning while I was away at class. And I hired a lawyer and went through a 52-page record contract that guys didn't sign up for college for the following semester because we already were booked on a tour that was going to put us in front of us. Right. You know, 250 to 350,000 people within three or four months, an arena tour with a bunch of other top notch Christian artists. Three days before I was supposed to sign the record deal, after two and a half, almost three months of negotiating it, lawyers and contracts and everything, the record company went out of business. And all of a sudden, the other companies weren't interested in me anymore. And guys (laughs) were begging and pleading to get back into college. Other guys had to go find jobs. You know, uh, I lived in a house with four or five of the other guys in my band, and I would say probably 70% of the time the heat never even worked in the home we were living in. I used to wear a stocking cap to bed at night and lived on an air mattress oh for goodness. a year. So there's always there's always stuff like that when you're starting something that 
you've never done before and that maybe other people haven't done really before either. And so you're always going to have some people that get it and that kind of are along the way of the journey for you. You're always going to have some people that don't or that are going to give you this much. And, and if they can give you that much, then great. Then you learn how to do what you can do with that much, but also find out ways where you can continue to do more. I, that doesn't really answer your question, but I guess what I'm trying to say is, yes, I've absolutely had that experience. I'm, I'm completely grateful to every single guy who's ever played in Denver in the Mile High Workshop. It's been a few, you know, over 20 years. Um, and those guys gave a lot. They, they sacrificed a lot. They gave a lot. I tried to give back as much as I could. And the best part of the whole thing has been the journey is, you know, being on the <laughs> bus late at night watching a movie after a show or, you know, being in a really unique place, uh, you know, playing at the Summer Olympics in Greece. Or, I mean, just all these different things that would have never happened had those guys not given so much. But also realizing that in order to grow, you always have to give more and uh, surrounding yourself with the right kind of people to be able to do that. Oh, that's that. That's a, there's a lot of really a lot of wisdom in, in that that I'll have to go back and listen to several times. Well, I will tell you, and I want to say I want to say something really, really important to me in this particular moment. Most of the guys that are with me, you know, here, here in the year 2018 and different the Mile Orchestra, they've been around with me for a very, very long time. Um, you know, Jared, my drummer, has been with me 17 years. Yeah. Uh, my bass player's been with me 16 years. Uh, Josh Harner, our lead trumpet player, he came up with the name of the band almost 20 years ago. Yeah, you know, and and what has been interesting is these guys over the course of time have gotten other gigs, like they've gotten tours that have lasted sometimes one, two, six, eight months long. And I said, go for it, go do it. Like, you know, this is a huge important part of your career. This is going to be the growth for you. I say, you're a member of a family here. You're a member of our group, and I'll find subs, and we'll find ways to work it out while you're gone but you know to the very best of my human ability i've really tried to stay loyal to the guys that i knew were supposed to be a part of our group in turn in me trying to be loyal and flexible with them they have been so unbelievably loyal and flexible with me and it has culminated in some of the best friendships i've ever had in my life you know we've seen certain guys come and go throughout the years but the core of who we are has been together for a very 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 long time and there are seasons, sometimes there are seasons where there's not a lot of shows, where people just aren't booking or things don't have the budget. Those guys are off doing other tours and other things, and I applaud that because what we do have does, does in a way feel like family, and I'm incredibly grateful to those guys. As much as I've tried to stand by them, I'm super grateful that they stood by me through all the ups and downs of my own life. And so that has been, uh, it's made all the difference for me. That's great. Yeah, well, and I, I wondered, because um, I, I was going through trying to look up some of the guys that uh, had played with you in the past, and it seems like, I mean, a good majority of them have been played played with a lot of different artists, and, uh, you know, especially, like, uh, a lot of different Christian artists and stuff in the, Absolutely. In the world of, like, uh, I know there's a couple guys who have played with Toby Mac on occasion, yeah. and they're still doing well, and some of them still play with you. So, oh, yeah, yeah, I mean, these guys, these guys are incredibly talented, you know, I mean, if you ever hear, uh, you know, a live show, you know, Denver in the Mile Hour show, um, you know, it is about the band. The band is so good. The band is so talented. They are very, very flexible stylistically. They're very diverse, and they're just really good musicians. And so when they're not playing with me, a lot of them are playing with some other really big-time acts. You know, my drummer Jared has his own recording studio. He's producing all kinds of records for all kinds of bands. You know, Tony, my bass player, he teaches teach college music, you know, college-level courses on bass. I mean, just all, all the guys are so very, very talented and unique in their own ways, and they have a lot to offer. I think there's a lot of people who um, they don't realize, because you guys did a ton of stuff before you ever, in 2007, you guys played, uh, or you were on the show, The Next Great American Band. And um, but I mean, at that point, you guys still had already you had already done several albums. Then you guys performed in Ireland and Greece, and like you mentioned, uh, playing the Olympics. Um, and w- was there? Would you? Did you see a very big difference in career after that show, or was it? You know, just kind of, um, just kind of a gradual motion, just moving forward, or was it? You know, did it explode? Here's what I've found after having a career for 20 years: is it is kind of like waves in the ocean. 
you're always going to have, uh-huh. it, hopefully if you're doing it right, you're going to have some peaks along the way, and you might have some dips, and then you might come to another peak, and then more dips. You know, it's kind of like breathing in and out. That's kind of the way my mm-hmm. career has gone. So, yeah, I mean, we've had different, we've had all kinds of, I mean, I can name you, you know, doing the showcase at Belmont was a huge spike because it gave us the chance to possibly get a deal and get in front of people. Then, you know, that fell through, and then it had this big dip, and then it was like, I had to be able to go. I had a wonderful opportunity to be able to go play at one of these pre rallies they had in 1999 and beginning into 2000 for a Billy Graham crusade that was coming to Nashville. And we weren't going to be a part of the actual crusade, but they were having these pre rallies months and months in advance to kind of get churches excited and prepared and to bring their friends and we got invited to do one of these pre-rallies at first baptist church nashville downtown and there were a lot of influential people that cause we didn't have an album yet like we, i was begging and pleading people to let us come play at their church and we didn't have a recording for them to really listen to besides the little two-song right. demo that we had and so you know that was a huge opportunity and it was like all these huge opportunities that, that felt very huge at the time and they were big kind of were like stair steps. They, they kind of were the step to the next spot, and then it would plateau off, and then a step to the next spot, and it would plateau off. And so doing the TV show was one of many, many, many steps, and it was a huge help to us. But there were probably 30, 20 or 30 steps before that one that were just as huge in their own way, or we wouldn't have made it to there if we right. weren't there. Um, and yeah. we still have some of those types of things. The, 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 the interesting thing now, I think, as some of the ideas... And the dreams that I feel like God has given me are getting bigger. To get to the next step takes longer. It just, it takes a little longer, and it takes a little more money, and it takes a little more prayer, and, <laughs> and uh, you know, I'm walking through the different steps. But we still, I still really feel at almost 20 years that we still have, hopefully, a few more steps left in us um, to be able to do some really unique things. Yeah, I hope so. I hope so, because it's a, a bringing big band music into the Christian realm, I think is just, I mean, it's, I'm glad that you guys are there because it's, it's a whole different side of Christian music and uh, something that I think needs to be out there, especially, you know, there's some musicians out there who really criticize like shows like American Idol and the voice and all that stuff. And I just wonder with you being on a show kind of like that, what do you have a different kind of viewpoint of it? Is it, um, I mean, so I just heard a lot of critiques from certain musicians who just, who feel like that's a, like a false idea of how you become famous or? Well, I mean, the interesting thing about American Idol now is it is, it's not like it's been around for one or two years and we don't really know what happens from shows like that. It's been around now for almost 20 years. Right. I mean, Idol's been around almost as long as my band has. Um, and so it, it has a track record, a track record to show what it can and, and can't be. I mean, it has... Gosh, it has um, birthed some incredible stars. Right. Um, you know, in 2009, I had the opportunity to travel and tour for almost an, for at least, gosh, seven months, eight months of the year. When our band was taking a little bit of a break, I, I toured with Kelly Clarkson, yeah. um, putting the horn the section together for her. And uh, what an incredible artist, what a really, really dear and wonderful person. Kelly's just a very genuine and a wonderful woman and by far one of the most talented singers and musicians I've ever met in my life. You know, but, you know, she she <laughs> rightfully should be a star because she's one of the most incredible singers on the planet, bar none. I mean, but American Idol was a chance for her to be able to be noticed in a way that maybe she couldn't have been noticed before. You know, other people like Carrie Underwood, they have every right to be where they are, even though they were recognized and garnered fans on that show there were still albums to make there were still songs to write there were still tours to perform you know the artists that have come out of that show that have really done well are crazy talented people i think that my view is a little bit different ah, the, pro- the problem is that th- those shows have uh, cultivated this idea that you know i'm a nobody and i'm instantly going to become somebody and now i'm going to be a millionaire and i'm going to make a lot of money and now my family's going to be so happy and uh and my life's going to be great because i got to sing one or two songs on a show and people voted for me the tough part is (laughs) there's not a whole lot real about reality tv i think my view of the of those types of shows are this 
those shows are like any other television show in the fact that they are entertainment, that they are telling stories, that they're telling the stories of people that have a lot of hopes and dreams of making it as a musician. I went on that show with a lot of hopes that it was going to continue the career that we had. And to a certain extent, even though we didn't win the show, a lot of those things did really, really help us. So on certain levels, I think a lot of my hopes were realized. I also think that you just got to kind of remember what these shows are, you know, and that they are entertainment, that they're about making entertainment. And the intent of the people making the shows are to make a really entertaining show that lots of people are going to watch on TV. Can you be critical that it's a vehicle to... Um, that's not the way people should make it in a career or be famous. Well, it's the way some people have made it, and, and that's okay. Um, right. But nothing is going to take away from hard work. Nothing's going to take away from doing a ton of soul searching and writing incredible songs that touch and reach, you know, the emotional heart of, of people. And nothing's going to take away from those things. You know, technology. I mean, this opens us such, such a huge can because technology has shifted and changed so often and so much that it's almost even made reality TV shows not as relevant. You know, you've got, Mm -hmm. you become a viral sensation on YouTube um, if you have the right gimmick or you have the right song or you have the right this or the right that and, you know, post it on a a YouTube site and maybe within a month you might have four or five million views. You don't have to be on a a national television show at all. So it's, it's, it's just a different world that we're living in with lots of different avenues to try to get your voice heard or your music exposed. You know, and it's all up for grabs. We auditioned for the show because we thought it could really help us with our core audience growing, and and it did that. And I'm grateful that we did it. You mentioned about uh, touring with Kelly Clarkson. I was going to ask you what what's it what's it like for you? I mean, because you're obviously a, a great front man and do a great job at singing and everything, but you're also a fantastic trumpet player. And so, what's it like? But what is the difference for you going from being in the front, being um, the supporting musician? Well, you always, I mean, whatever context you're making music, you got to know your role. You know, some of the best musicians that I've ever worked with may not have always been the most technically glamorous or most amazing players, but some of the best musicians I've ever worked with were the guys that knew their role and knew how to do their role perfectly well. You know, uh, Paul Shearer, my guitar player, yeah. this guy is unbelievable. He is an unbelievable guitar player. He has incredible chops. He has incredible technique. I, I, um, there are certain guys that could do more amazing things maybe than he can, but he's one of the most diverse guys, and he's one of the most musical guitar players I've ever played with because he knows his role, and that's the reason that he tours Julio Iglesias. You know, he, he flies all over the world. I think he's, you know, concerts on private cruise boats. I mean, just crazy things because he knows his role as a musician, and he fits that role perfectly. And so that's to the best I could of my own ability. You know, when I was out there being a trumpet player with Kelly Clarkson, that's what I was hired to do, was to be a trumpet player with Kelly Clarkson and to do that role hopefully very excellently well. And and uh, I love doing all the different kinds of roles in music because you learn, and number one, as a musician, you learn so much more about what music's all about. My jazz band instructor growing up, in college, uh, Dr. Kirk said, you know, the more I learn about music, the more I realize I don't know. Um, and if you've ever heard him play, uh, his name is Jeff Kirk, just go find a record. I mean, this guy, nominated for Grammys, unbel- he is a freak show on on the saxophone. And to hear him say something like that when I was young, like, are you crazy? And then... You know, as I've gotten a little bit older, the, the, the same rings true. So I love doing different roles in music because it gives me the chance to learn, gives me the chance to grow as a musician, gives me the chance to experience things that I couldn't have experienced on my own. You know, mm-hmm. Kelly had an incredible tour that year. We did all the different state fairs everywhere. Had a blast. Had a blast, you know, being able to hang out with some of the guys from my own band, you know, yeah. making music for one of the greatest singers on the planet and backing her up. What a great story I get to tell my grandkids someday. So. Right. Yeah, and I think, I think yeah, obviously, it sounds like you have to have the right amount of humility to, to be a musician, at least from what, you, what you're saying it sounds like to me, um, that you, you, can't, you can't be egotistical about what position you're in. 
Well, I think it's 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 just like anything in life. You have to have balance, right? You have to have a certain amount of confidence that okay, I, this is what I can bring to the table. I know what my limits are. I know what I'm good at, and this is what I can bring to the table. It's just like any other job in that regard. You know, this is what I'm qualified to do based on my past experience or based on my ability. And so you need to have a solid confidence, you know, to walk in and, and be able to do a good mm-hmm. job. But you also have to come in with a wide open mind because music, music, 98% of the music that you make in life is going to be with other people, you know? <laughs> you're going to be in a band or you're going to be, you know, in a horn section. You're going to be with this person. You're going to be with that person. And so you've got to work with others. You've got to learn to play together. You've got to learn where your role is. Whether you're a front man, if that's your role, or whether you're, you know, the guy wrapping cables at the end of the show. Like, everybody has a part to play. It's a team. And when everybody's doing their role to the best of their ability and we're all doing it well together, that's when you win, you know. And it's just knowing what role you're in that day. You know, in my world as a professional artist, if you want to call me that, in 20 years, I... I I have different roles. I mean, part of the money that I've made in my career has been from being a writer and an arranger and people buying my charts and playing their charts in their different bands. I've had people in, gosh, New Zealand and Australia or in Britain or, you know, in Asia, you know, buying my charts in South America and and, and using those charts. Uh, You know, so that's part of what I do. And part of what I do is a front man singing and talking and telling stories about my life and trying to connect emotionally with the audience that's in front of me part of what i do is a backup singer doing choral recordings in nashville for publishing companies that are producing more choral print music for christmas cantatas and different things like that like you know and part of what i do is is, is being a backup trumpet player and so part of what i do is being a trumpet soloist for my own band there's there's all these different roles that even in the realm of what i do to make a living sometimes my role is the booking agent calling up churches or promoters saying, hey, would you like to do a Christmas concert with Denver the Mile Hope Church here? And hearing no 38 times to get one yes. But part of that's my role, too. Part of my role right. is, is running contracts um, for the show. And uh, I've got people to help me along do that some of the stuff, but sometimes some of those responsibilities sometimes fall on me as well. So there's a lot of different roles in being what you would consider an artist, I guess, in this day and age, you know? Do you see, I mean, I know you're in Nashville, so uh, there's a good, probably, there's a mixture of, I mean, the secular music business world and the Christian music world, or business world. Is there, I mean, do you tend to cross over those lines pretty easily? Is there, do you see a big difference between the two the two genres, or you could say? I, I mean, I think there's a ton of genres, you know. Um, right. The, the, the. You know, the gospel and Christian uh, contemporary music world, uh, Southern gospel world, um, all these different, what we would call religious music, um, you know, Nashville seems to be, and it seems to have been for a long time, like the hub, where a lot of that music is recorded and produced, you know, from a publishing standpoint, in the grand scheme of music, as far as commercial music goes, I'm not really talking about classical, but as far as commercial and pop music, the, the the biggest songwriting town in the world. I mean, not just in the United States, but in the world would be Nashville. You know, all the different publishers are there. So much of the music that's written in Nashville is recorded in L.A. or in New York. It's, it's a huge publishing town. You know, Nashville is so much more than country music, but you do have a marriage. I mean, even country music, uh, so many of these artists and so much of the genre in itself is rooted in old gospel songs and old gospel music and so you've got a lot of crossover between you know i'm gosh i even I mean, lots of you know current country artists sing about god sing religious songs but it's, it's been that way forever i can even remember elvis you know at one point in time he was singing rock and roll he was recording gospel albums and he was also on the you know top five of a country chart Right. You know, Elvis sang at the Grand Ole Opry once. He didn't go over very well, but <laughs> so there's. I guess what I'm trying to say is, there's always been a history between what's considered gospel and Christian music and the country music world. There, there seems to be a lot of crossover there. You, you see Christian artists 
singing at the Grand Ole Opry. I just heard of somebody that's coming up very, very recently. Goodness gracious, Danny Gokey. Danny Gokey's going to be singing at the Grand Ole Opry very soon. And he's a contemporary Christian artist. And so that kind of thing happens a lot, and it happens a lot in Nashville. You know, we don't fit the country world at all, but I think what our band has done is we do kind of fit this whole, you know, horn band kind of idea. Some of it is swing, and then some of it sounds kind of like 60s and 70s horn band music, you know, and some of what we do is original, and some of it we do our covers, you know, and we get the, the opportunity to do, you know, different fairs, county fairs, state fairs, we do performing arts centers, so... Uh, we do kind of live in both of those worlds a little bit, and, and it seems to, to work just fine. You know, I, I have had a lot of people, not a lot, I've had some people throughout the years, like when I did this show on television on Fox, and I, I remember a family, I remember where we were at, I'm not going to talk about where all that was, but I, I remember family coming up to me after the show, and we were in an autograph line at, at uh at a Christian event, and they just said, you know, I can't believe that you would be on Fox like that, hmm. you know. And they didn't say they didn't say that I had lost my salvation, but they had they did say that I had lost my way. Interesting. Um, and they said that they would pray, and they said that they would pray for me. And I said, you know, by all means, pray for me. I, I need the prayer, just like any of us do. Um, I appreciate your prayers, but it wasn't like that. Like, you know. I remember talking to a pastor, and he said, Denver, we need as many Christians in the <laughs> in the quote-unquote secular entertainment world. We need Christians there, too, right. just like we need Christians in the Christian world. Um, and I never really thought about it that way. I think that growing up for me, there was always this, um, there's a line in the sand, and you draw it, and you're either this or you're, or you are that, and there's no, not even any in-between, but... But golly, you know, we need Christian plumbers. Right. You know, we need Christian teachers. We need Christian, you know, anything. And and we need Christian entertainers as well, not just in the Christian world, but outside of, of the Christian world. And, you know, I feel like we uphold our values and we are able to be true to who we are as believers. And we found opportunities to be able to do that within the more mainstream world, you know, and hopefully be a very wholesome and encouraging entity within that right. world. Yeah, you can still be a Christian if you're playing vehicle. You know, that's still a possibility. Thank. I, I'm trying to wrap up. I know you got you got to go soon. What one last thing? I was I was going to ask you a few kind of nerdy questions just for the uh, the music pe- the music people. I was going to ask that. Uh, what what's the gear you're playing? What like trumpet and mouthpiece? Um, is there a specific valve oil you're using right now? Or <laughs> <laughs> would you know it? I ran out of valve oil. I was sitting in North Carolina this morning, and I, I ran out of valve oil. So I, I have a Yamaha that I'm playing, and and the valves were so sticky that I had pulled out my old Bach uh, Strad, which is pretty road, road worry. It needs a new belt. Yeah. But the, the valves weren't sticky on it, so I played it because I'm out of valve oil. <laughs> I don't have any. And it's Sunday, <laughs> so I don't know any music stores around. I don't know what I'm going to do tonight. But, um... No, man, I'm not really, I mean, uh, I play Yamaha, and golly, it's a, it's a lightweight horn. Is it the Custom Z, the it's Bobby, Bobby Shoe one? It's, it's a very, very bright horn. Okay. It's a very bright commercial sounding horn. Yeah. And I've played on a lot of different horns throughout the years. I was on a Confidence one for years, which was a cool horn. had a massive sound to it. Yeah. But it was large bore, and it just... The problem for me in what I do on a normal basis is that I sing a lot. And so I'm singing, and sometimes that horn is sitting there for 25, 20, 25 minutes at a time, and it's cold. Right. I have to just pick it up and instantly try to sound halfway decent on it. And so as I've gotten a little older, i found I can sound better, quicker on a lighter on a lighter weight horn. I play on a silky, so I'm on a pretty bright commercial horn our music's pretty upbeat so it works um mm-hmm. and then i'm on a silky 13a 4 a so it's a little bit shallower of a, of a i don't play like super super high i'm not screaming double c's i've never played a double c in my life but I, you know i'll play a, i'll play a few f's and g's and different things like that throughout the show and so i gotta be on a mouthpiece where i can really hit those and hopefully hit them you know mildly accurately quickly you know, without a lot of warm up or without my hands and my lips really being able to get on the horn much. I have a box strat that I love. It's 
really, really, really good horn. But, you know, it went airborne at the Winter Olympics in uh, <laughs> Salt Lake City. It's a long story, but it completely punctured the bell near where it connects to the horn. And I've worked and worked and worked to try to get it right. It's still not right. You know, I just need to get a new bell on it. You know, it's just it's just got some issues. I'm going to get a new tuning slide for it. I think once I really fix up that horn better, then I'll probably be playing that one more. Um, but it is a bigger, it's yeah. a bigger bore horn too, you know, than the, than the Yamaha is. But I kind of play on both of those, and sometimes I play two at one time. I've got a little mouthpiece that I use yeah. from Picket Brass that makes some really cool mouthpieces that, you know, it's one mouthpiece that has two different types coming out, so you can play two horns at one time, which is kind of fun. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty fun. What music are you listening to by yourself usually in the car? Oh my goodness. I'm the most eclectic. You know, eclectic person. I love I love country music. I love bluegrass. I love big band. I listen to some pop. I love 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 sixties music. I think the music of the nineteen sixties some of the best music I've ever listened. You know, ever. I listen mm-hmm. to a bunch of sixties today. I love Frank Sinatra. I love Harry Connick. I totally love Michael Bublé. I, I listen to it all. I, I yeah. I'm not, I don't think I'm ADD, but I just you know I love. I think life has variety in it for a reason, so enjoy it. Mm-hmm. So, right, music same way. Okay. Yeah, and then is there any uh, is there anything you would want to leave off with? Any advice you give to uh, musicians or just the uh, people in general? Yeah, I would say two things. I would say number one, when God gives you a calling, or when you feel really deep down inside that you've kind of discovered what it is that you're supposed to do in life. Don't give up on it because life is going to give you a million opportunities to, on a silver platter, to give up and to say, that's it, it's over. Life's given me a million opportunities, and I haven't done that. You know, I've come close a couple of times. I'm not going to say it's easy, but I would have missed out on a lot of really incredible blessings. Follow the leading that God gives you until he leads you in a different way. But just because it gets hard doesn't mean that you give up on the way he led you. And so that's the first thing I'd say. And then the second thing I would say, especially to people that are performers, performers like me, um, is find your voice. Not, you know, find your angle or find your stick. I would say find your voice. And and what I mean by that, and this is more psychological and emotional, I guess, uh, a little bit spiritual, is that being a performer my whole life, I learned from a very young age that I was a a people pleaser and that I've, I've tried to really live a life that was to find the validation uh, of humans, of people. You know, the ultimate validation we'll ever get in our life is from God. I believe that with everything in me, uh, every fiber of my being. But I believe that God has given each and every one of us a voice, a voice to express who we are at the heart of us, uh, our hopes and our dreams, our fears, our needs. And I think sometimes as performers, it's very easy for us to put our own voice aside, to try to live a life constantly trying to please everybody around us. That might sound kind of strange, but I've just gone through a real season of life where in some ways I feel like I'm, I'm really, God's allowing me the opportunity to, to figure out who I really am at the core of me. And as I have learned that better, it has given me the the opportunity and the ability to really be able to speak to my audience in a different way, um, using my own voice. And so that might sound deep or that might sound strange, but that's the advice I would give, not just any musician, but to, to anybody walking through life, is uh, God has, has birthed lots of things inside of you. Um, and don't put those things aside just because the going gets hard or just because some people don't approve. Find your voice and seek God, and you're going to be okay. Well, thank you so much. I appreciate appreciate you getting the time to talk with the, uh, talk with me, and uh, really, really looking forward to you coming um, in a couple of weeks here. Last thing, I was going to say, I hear you have a pretty good uh, Bobcat Goldthwait impression. Do you oh, still do oh, my, oh, my goodness gracious. <laughs> Boy, you put everybody on the spot. Well, there's, <laughs> I, I do some impressions. The Bobcat one is just okay. Yeah, probably the best impression I do that I've been doing since I was five years old, honestly, is my Donald Duck impression. Oh my gosh! I have probably the I'm not bragging, <laughs> but I probably have one of the best Donald Duck impressions you've ever heard in your entire life. Yeah. So, I'll I'll do that one for you. The Bobcat one is really taxing on my voice. I'm I got to sing here real oh, soon. Oh sure, yeah. And yeah. I'm 
and I'm too tired. <laughs> My voice is too tired to do Bobcat today. That's an exhausting one, yeah. Casey, I'm going to say, hey, Casey, this is Denver. Denver in the Mile High Works and I can't wait to make music with you real soon. How's that sound? Uh, that sounds great. All right. Hi, Casey. How are you doing? This is Buffalo. Buffalo in the Mile High Works Street. The Mile High Works Street. Well, I'm Oh my goodness! <laughs> Dude, that was that was amazing. I don't even know how you there do you that. Go. That was incredible. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm the man of about two talents. <laughs> you just heard one of them. Charge of the bad love, Jericho, Jericho, Jericho. Charge of the bad love, Jericho, and the walls came tumbling down. Charge of the bad love, Jericho, Jericho, Jericho. Charge of the bad love, Jericho, and the walls came tumbling, tumbling. So I can sing my song, have a little church, and do our thing. Everybody's rocking to the Sunday school swing. Ooh, the Sunday school swing. He's got the whole world in his hands. 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 Sun is gonna sway. Oh, the sun is gonna sway. Jesus loves me, the sun knows. 